and Jack, you can take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Karen. And again, it's my oh. honor and pleasure to be able to help out uh, with this uh, esteemed uh, group that has such an incredible heritage. Um, it's again, it's, it's an honor. Um, you can hopefully see my uh, desktop right now with this uh, page that's up on the screen. Is that correct? Yes. The one thing that you want out of all this is this bottom little URL. Okay, tiny URL. If you've never used that, it's a real fun service that allows you to shorten URLs. So it's tinyurl.com slash Davis Chicago files, and then today's date, um, 1-22-21. And what that's going to give you is um, one last week's class, the entire class. I was going to try and uh, add that as a, as a little um, perk to uh, joining one of our uh, payment classes or another class that I have coming up. But I thought, you know, um, we might as well just post everything for you all. I'm not making this a public link. So uh, this is just for the uh, uh, people attending tonight and the, uh, the Chicago uh, Fort Dearborn. So, um, but this going to here is going to give you all these files, including a PDF with these live links. So you shouldn't have to type this in or do any of this. So all you really need is this bottom address. Once you click on that, that's a zip file that will have links to all of these things. So we have that. Um, this is, I posted this earlier. This is obviously for tonight's um, class. Um, but actually this one right here is my own website. It's a brand new site that's going to be going up. Jack Davis, How to Wow. Um, I wrote a series of books called the Photoshop Wow Book and the How to Wow Books. I have about 2 million uh, copies in print in 12 languages, blah, blah, blah. Um, but if you sign up here, then you'll be able to get a link for tonight's class. So this is how I will go ahead and publish it to YouTube, which is what this is. So if you come up here and give me your uh, email address, then um, I will get to you this evening's class um, to you as well. Thank you. This right here is a link to a YouTube link. And because last week was on shooting and we ended up going a little long, I wasn't able to cover using Lightroom Mobile to shoot raw. Uh, specifically, we've been talking about the ability to actually shoot an infrared shot on these uh, amazing little iPhones. And so this is a nine minute video that I created talking about the different options of shooting inside of Lightroom Mobile. I'll touch on it briefly tonight, but I wanted to give a little bit more uh, in depth on my shooting method, um, specifically using the HDR options within Lightroom Mobile to be able to shoot um, anything, but also uh, infrared. So that's what this is about. And then just for fun, because I know that we wouldn't be able to cover everything that I'd like to cover, this is kind of a teaser for this right here that um, Karen and I have worked out that on May 22nd, we'll do a full day online workshop um, for the uh, Chicago Dearborn group. And um, that will be on the uh, streamlining and integration of a Lightroom and Photoshop workflow, which will include both desktop versions of those and the mobile versions of those. So the complete integration of desktop and mobile in Photoshop and Lightroom. And that's when we're going to be able to dig in deeper into things like a automated workflow, making presets using profiles, um, the new Photoshop or iPad, et cetera, et cetera. So this right here is a tease for that. This is a course that I did for last year's Adobe Max on Lightroom Mobile and Photoshop for iPad. So it's a tease about those subjects right there. So I'm giving that to you as well. That's an hour long class. Basically um, just a bunch of stuff for you to play with. All of this is available at um, this tiny URL right here. That will take you to this PDF where these links are all live. So you don't, like I said, you don't have to retype them in. 
And uh, last thing that you'll find when you go to that link, I told you about my snake oil. This is the one event that I put on every year myself um, on the island of Molokai in Hawaii, Creative Photography for the Soul. And uh, that'll be this November. We're back with our vaccines and everything else. We'll be able to do it. And uh, November 5th through the 13th, eight, eight days on Molokai. And that's with myself and uh, two other amazing uh, photographers, um, Ricky Cook, National Geographic, and then Dwight Jones, National Geographic outdoor photographer, um, celebrate what's right with the world. If you know Dwight, um, he lives on Molokai as does Ricky. And that's how I'm able to get them there. So if you're interested, this entire um, invite for the week is also in that packet of information to be found um, here at this tiny URL, Davis Chicago Files 12221 or 12221. Okay, does that all make sense, everybody? Just make a screenshot of that. As long as you've got that bottom one, you go there. And again, it's a zip file that'll have links to everything. It also has this in here because we couldn't, you never have enough um, information. So this is where you're gonna put in your email for next week's, for this week's class to receive the recording of this one. You'll just give it to me and that way I can send you out the link once we create it. Um, but you're also gonna find uh, this, these are the apps we're going to be talking about tonight. This is something that I shared with you last week, that this is what we're going to be touching on. You're going to, because we're going to be talking about Snapseed, um, I wanted to share with you this um, page that I've created of notes of its interface, its tools, its export, automating and enhancing recipes, targeted adjustments, and creative embellishing more or less just an outline of um, how I teach some of the things inside of Snapseed. So this is also in that zip file that you'll find there. There's also an overview on retouching, which we're gonna get into. So it talks about um, resuscitating tone. And again, it's basically an outline of tonight. So you've got something to uh, look at or refer back to. Retouching distractions, talking about touch retouch, which is excellent. Blurring and blending backgrounds, focus, we're going to talk about. And then things like enhancing portraits, we're going to touch on the face app tonight as well. There's also an overview. Tim, if you're in the audience, thank you for this shot. Um, but this is a um, talking about optimizing your photos in the built in photos editor. So, out of all the options, if you've used any of those, these are the ones that I like. These are what they do. So again, I'll do an overview of it tonight, but you'll have this as a resource to refer back to. Okay, optimizing your iPhone photos with a new quick and easy built-in photos editor. And then, like I said, the invitation. And last but not least, I'm gonna uh, do a quick overview of Lightroom Mobile. This right here is what I call my seven-step tango for optimizing images inside of Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. Doesn't matter if it's mobile Lightroom, doesn't matter if it's classic or CC. Um, these are the order of the steps that I do in optimizing images. And we'll touch on that tonight, but um, I wanted to give you this outline as well as part of the uh, reference files for tonight. Okay, questions? Yeah. Jack, that's very generous of you. We thank you. I'm sure you, you've made many people happy here. And uh, I wanted just to remind people to uh, keep yourselves mute. And if you would turn off your video during the presentation, we'll have time for questions afterwards. I see we already have one. Diana Phillips had a question. Um, so we'll address those later. And um, if, if you have an urgent uh, something or other, or, or if um, there's something technical that's wrong and you wanna let us know, you could uh, let us know in the chat file, but otherwise our questions will be at the end. So thanks and Jack, I'll 
let you take it away again. Okay. So the question is, first off, why enhance? And the little story that I'll just throw out here, um, one of the um, first times I was teaching at a conference called Photofusion, which by the way is next month in, in uh, Florida, um, F-O-T-O-F-U-S-I-O-N, Photofusion. I highly recommend it. It's gonna be online this year as everything is. But I often teach down there with a, with a famous photographer, Vincent Versace, and we often show each other's work. And I was showing him some of the stuff that I was working on. And uh, he goes, well, why did you leave this branch in this little landscape? And I go, because it was there. And this was back at the dawn of digital photography when there was all this question about, is it really photography? The fact that there's no film, does it really count? And there was all this back and forth kind of the canceled culture that's so popular right now, that digital photography wasn't real photography. And uh, when I told him that's the reason why I left it in, he said, that's the stupidest thing in the world. You are not a, um, a documenting photographer. You are not a uh, work for the newspaper where you are recording history. Your job is to make something that people want to live with that they would put above their couch and just longingly gaze at your work forever. Your job is to tell a story. Your job is to communicate with people. And because it does not matter whether that branch actually happened to be there on that day at that time, you have the permission of Vincent Versace to change your image, to do whatever is needed to make it the most potent, memorable, motivating image that you can. And all we need to do is go back to uh, St. Ansel Adams to um, see if you're familiar with his work and how much retouching he did, um, not only physical retouching of actual prints, but also of course his darkroom work of dodging and burning as well as using some extensive filtering of images to go beyond what was actually in front of him at the time he pressed the shutter. His use of amber and red filters kind of a precursor to infrared photography. And um, that's how he got his wonderful black skies and everything else. So anyway, all that's to say that if you're in a beautiful scene like this down in the Grand Canyon, there's nothing wrong with bringing out the storm clouds that were in the scene waiting to come in, even though with the mist in the, in the air, there was no way to capture it at the moment of taking the exposure. That includes dodging and burning. One of the things we'll be talking about are these things called targeted adjustments and how to do those on these mobile devices. So um, here again, misty day over on Molokai. We do love shooting our waves. A lot of these little adjustments are um, just getting our tone correct, extending our histogram, so to speak. This one is, and these are coming in backwards, uh, it is a raw file. We talked about this last week and shooting directly into the sun, afternoon sun, that was what the camera exposed for. This was before things like um, smart HDR and um, um, fusion that uh, Apple has built into the iPhones. This would not have been a shot taken with the, uh, the current iPhone. This was an older one actually shooting in raw, but it did allow a huge amount of tonal range in the file. So this is what we're talking about, this idea that what we uh, may have shot or what our camera exposed for is not what we're limited. Whether it's subtle or whether it's extreme, we have the ability to fine tune um, our images to tell the most potent story that is possible. Also things, one of the main uh, tools that we've used that. forever, we talked I'm about this last that. week, is this idea of being able to have a shallow depth of field, right? What would typically be done with an open F stop. Our website on the calendar page. Karen, you're gonna need to uh, mute your, your microphone. If you can type uh, in the chat, any answers you wanna give people, that'd be great. Um, so this is simply being able to um, create our shallow depth of field, which again is one of our primary things when it comes to telling stories. 
It could be something as simple as um, softening some skin tone, which we'll touch on that's built into a lot of um, different apps. It could be taking advantage of some of the features like live photo. I mentioned last week, one of the things built into the native camera is that if you shoot in live mode and you see this little icon up here, that means that if you swipe up on the image, you actually have the ability to jump over to either a motion-based representation of that image or even a long exposure. And so even though this is handheld, no tripod, low light, three second exposure, I'm able to get razor sharp rocks and get our wonderful misty water. And then of course, being able to enhance that by um, going into something like Snapseed, their native, native editor. So this is the entire topic of being able to enhance. Again, something as simple as a, some small statuary and then telling a more elaborate story with it with something like Snapseed where we can antique the image, add some dust and scratches, some light leaks, maybe even a little kind of a Polaroid transfer edge. All of these are based upon how you want to tell the story about what was in front of you at the time that you pressed the shutter. Okay, so you get the basic idea here on this idea of optimizing or enhancing a file. Again, this is our beloved Molokai. And again, this is a live photo showing it in motion, showing motion blur, and then doing an enhancement of that particular file. Okay, I think you get the general idea of what is possible, live photo, letting the motion float, okay? And it could just be some simple retouching that makes it a more potent statement. Okay, you get the idea. And with the things like portrait mode, which we'll touch on briefly, uh, remember, anytime now that you can separate out the foreground from the background because it's actually creating what's known as a depth map, you can simply turn on these different edit modes in the uh, portrait options uh, within the camera editor to be able to create things like this, where it automatically drops out the background to black or white. You've seen this. These are what are known as the studio modes, and uh, we'll touch on that more. Okay. And with that, let's just jump into it. Speaking of the native editor. So a little portrait uh, that I took of some uh, neighbors, wonderful, awesome young couple. And I'm going to edit it. As you can see up here in the upper right, everybody can see this little edit up here. Nod your head enthusiastically, making sure you can see it all. So we're gonna go into the editor and you'll notice that this actually was taken with the portrait mode setting in the native camera. You can tell that because it says portrait up here in the top. You'll notice that it's not yellow. That means it's not turned on. If I turn it on by tapping on it, you'll notice this is what I saw when I took the picture. This is that depth map that I was talking about that is imitating a shallow depth of field. And you'll notice that it's not just a shallow depth of field in the sense of blurring. You actually can see the shape of the iris that would be in a traditional bokeh or bokeh. As we come up here to the upper left-hand corner, you'll notice two little icons. The first is this little hexagon here. And that is telling me that I've got the ability to change these different light modes that are associated with this portrait shooting mode. Because I shot it in this, you look down at the bottom, you have these little tubes. And we touched on this briefly um, last week, where I can come up here and actually change the lighting for this scene after the fact. Everything that you do with this is non-destructive. So this is called the high key lighting mono. This came in with the iPhone 11. Stage lighting on black. 
stage light, which is increasing um, as a full color on black. The contour light, let's actually jump over here. Natural light you can see is flat. It's not emphasizing the subject matter. By jumping over to the second one, studio light, I mentioned this last week that this is the, the default mode that I like to shoot in um, using the portrait mode because it automatically puts a little spotlight on our subject matter. It automatically can separate it out further popping it from the background. Um, typically this contour light is gonna be a little bit harsh for a portrait, but you could use it for a still life. The nice thing is, especially with the new um, iPhone 12s, with um, the iPhone 12 Pros is we have this new LiDAR sensor. Um, light and distance um, is what it is um, determining. It is a better way of uh, figuring out where a subject is in what's known as z-space. So um, it's adding to the quality of our little portrait mode here. But again, I like this um, secondary one. The nice thing is, if you look below the little cube, um, this one right here where it says studio light, you see a little line right below it, this one right here. And when you shift that, it allows you to fine tune this particular studio light that you just chose, which is awfully nice. Remember, when the iPhone or any computer does something nice for you, remember to say thank you. If something is not working in software, it's because you're copying an attitude, not because it's buggy. Remember that. Yes, I would usually get big laughs, but I know all your microphones are turned <laughs> off, so I can't, I can't hear you. Anyway, right next to, in the, going back to the upper left up here, you'll notice this f-stop, this apparent f-stop. Remember, all our iPhones, all smartphones actually have fixed f-stops. There is no variable f-stop in these little cameras. The little teeny lens aperture is just way too small to have a working diaphragm in there. So um, when you click on this, just as before, you have this little slider at the bottom, and this is where you could imitate what apparent f-stop you are actually choosing. And look at the background. As I shift down to 1.4, you'll notice that it actually are little hexagons as if it was a true diaphragm that was opening and closing. If you know how light works with um, f-stops, this is how it works. It is not just a Gaussian blur on the background. It's far from it. So as I mentioned before, I try not to get too greedy. Um, depending upon how good it did on masking out the hair, um, a you know, 5.6 is a nice default separation of the portrait from the background. Okay, It's up to you how far you want to take it. So while I'm here, I might as well do a few more of the edits. Remember, you do have a page that goes through my favorite edits in here. But right now we are looking at the bottom because this was taken in portrait mode. I'm still in this little cube, all the options associated with the portrait mode. If I jump over one to the right um, is where all the actual editing takes place in terms of color, tone, and sharpness. So um, we have auto, which is actually pretty good. It's a Great starting point for the most part. The nice thing is, even with auto, it's affecting the first 10 options. Everything that's been changed, anytime you see a little teeny yellow um, line going around the perimeter of these options, that's what's been changed. So if I go back here and turn off auto by tapping on it, so it's a tap, you can turn on or off any of these settings by tapping them. You'll notice as we go over, nothing has been changed in the file. I tap auto and these first 10 settings are gonna automatically be chosen. And I still have that little fine tune adjustment at the bottom. So it's affecting all 10 of those options at the same time by one little slider. So auto is a good place to start. If you don't like it, you just tap it again and you don't have to start with an auto adjustment, but it's not a bad place to start. Brilliance, I'm going to jump around. I would not use exposure for brightening your, uh, your image. It will automatically, as you can see here, it will blow out your highlights and it will plug up your shadows. It is not a good adjustment. Okay. 
So I do not uh, recommend using the exposure. There's brightness further down, which is mid-tone brightness, which is what you want. This is using highlight and shadow brightness, which will damage your image. Next one is brilliance. And this is, again, this is kind of balancing out your highlights um, and shadows. Very nice, quick and easy. You next have highlights, shadows. I'm going to brighten up my shadows just a little bit. Okay. You do have contrast. That auto usually does a good job of auto. Here's our overall brightness. And this is what I'd recommend. You'll notice how bright I can get it without blowing out the highlights which was different from exposure. So be very careful of exposure. You have black point. For those of you who uh, do a lot of editing inside of Photoshop or Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, you should know that black point is one of your most powerful adjustments that you have at your disposal. Especially if you come into something like shadow, bring in a lot of shadow detail, the black point is gonna allow you to not have muddy shadows but still have a nice crisp black point. So black point is um, really important in editing and it allows you to kind of anchor the contrast in your file. So um, get to know your black point. You have saturation and vibrance. Vibrance, as you probably know, is intelligent saturation. It is perfect, it is purposely little judicious when it comes to skin tones so they don't go fluorescent. So if you felt like you know doing it, I would probably start with vibrance rather than saturation as a default, okay? And then you have your warmth and tint or temperature and tint. So this is where you can come up and add or remove a little bit of warmth or coolness. This is yellow to blue, just as in temperature in Lightroom and Photoshop. The next one, tint is magenta to green, okay? Those are where it goes. So if you're getting something a little bit too magenta or too green, you can come up here, it'll make it more green or more magenta, okay? Next, you have sharpness. Good, don't get carried away. You really can't see all the different detail in a file um, on these tiny phones, so be cautious. If you're gonna do something that's gonna eventually go to print, Remember, you should be doing that on a desktop computer. Um, that's where final sharpness, sharpening should be done. But if you want to do put in there something like, you know, 10 to 15 to make it give it a little pop, it's a nice sharpening. And definition, much like clarity, can also be used to bring some pop into the image or, um, or not. Uh, again, I would not get carried away. Somewhere 10 to 15 is where I would go. And last, but uh, in the noise reduction, again, it's not the best noise reduction. I would probably stay away from it. Much better to do that on your desktop in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. Um, but there is a vignette here. And vignette can be very nice to, again, draw attention to the center of your composition. So there's the, when I tap on the screen, it gives me the before and then after. So tap is before, after, and I can see probably I'm gonna come up here and do a little bit uh, of brightness down, at least for what I'm seeing on this monitor. Okay, so those are the basic edits there. I went, I go through those in that little outline and talk about my favorites and why I don't use other ones. Next down at the bottom, down here, these are their filters. I typically don't use these. I'm gonna hand adjust my color and tone, but if you want in a particular effect, you certainly have all, excuse me, all sorts of different options here. I mentioned they do have some nice black and whites. The noir is as close as you'll get to kind of a faux infrared, but the mono is nice and neutral. And uh, if you'd like to go right ahead and use it, remember if you set something and say, okay, even something like a black and white, hit done, you can always come back and undo it. That filter is always there and it is always pliable. So um, everything you do here is non-destructive. And here is um, your crop. I'm gonna leave this crop as it is. I'm gonna say done. And for that last tool, let me go ahead and do a, uh, use another file here for um, that crop. 
So this is something from uh, last week's class. We talked about shooting infrared. So this was one of the shots that we took. I'm gonna go back over to that crop and straighten. I'm not gonna to need to rotate it, but I wanted to mention these two um, icons right here are for getting rid of what's known as keystoning. Okay, that is the perspective adjustment. So if I go to this second one, I can come up here and you can see I can straighten the sides of the buildings and bring it more into um, uh, vertical lines. Okay, so you have both a vertical and a um, horizontal one to be able to shift and um, fix that. Okay. And uh, I think that is good for the native, and, uh, native editor uh, at this moment. Um, we are talking about raw. There's a little bit on the raw and that shooting I mentioned, I did a separate uh, video for that. Um, let's go ahead and I'm just gonna go ahead and revert this and touch on a couple things related to doing a uh, raw edit. You can see this was actually taken with the Apple Pro Raw. Remember that is only available on the 12 Pros, 12 Pro and 12 Pro Max. This is shooting to a 720 uh, nanometer um, infrared filter that's just attached to the front of the iPhone. When I go into edit, it's taking advantage of the, all that raw material and I'm able to adjust it. The first thing when you're editing an infrared shot is going to be your white balance. This red, which is actually what the portion of the infrared spectrum is for this particular filter, can be removed by balancing out the temperature and tint. And it's gonna give you not only something that's a little bit more neutral, but it'll also give you the greatest dynamic range. When we get into talking about Lightroom, which has a better uh, white balance adjustment, you'll see there how that works. Also, when you shoot in Lightroom Mobile, you have the ability to shoot with a custom white balance. You can actually go to the eyedropper um, and say, I want you to create a custom white balance based upon something green in the file. And you can do that and it'll automatically neutralize the red cast, which is excellent. So that's an excellent editor, um, but this one is also good. Now that I've done my temperature and tint, I can turn it into a true black and white by desaturating what's left. I'm gonna then go to my contrast. I'm gonna bring that up um, because the black sky is what we know and love about infrareds. That's the wonderful um, thing about infrareds is your contrast is not based upon the color, the time of day, it's based upon the chemical makeup of your subject matter, blue and uh, blue skies, blue water, and things like green foliage. So simply by taking my contrast up, fixing my white balance, taking my contrast up, now I can go ahead and fine tune different elements of the image. Like in this case, it could be that I want to actually make my um, lights even lighter to exaggerate that contrast of this bright, you know, snowy uh, white foliage. And I can add things like a little bit of sharpness and maybe a little bit of definition to make that image pop. And we'll just finish it up with a little bit of vignette to again, exaggerate that darkness in the file. So there's our before there is our after. So that is doing a quick edit on a raw file um, taken through an infrared filter on the um, iPhone. It would be very similar if it was taken without raw. If you're using any iPhone that doesn't shoot raw, um, that's fine. It would be a very similar edit. Uh, I just wouldn't have quite the dynamic range. Um, do though remember that if you're using an 11 or any of the 12s that don't use RAW, do take advantage of night mode. Uh, night mode is going to give you the greatest dynamic range in a very dark situation, which is by definition what's happening when you're shooting through a black piece of glass. Use your night mode. Um, it'll allow you to do a handheld hand exposure of up to three seconds it'll take multiple exposures, combine those, reduce noise, extend dynamic range. So whether you shoot raw or not, use night mode. This, the uh, 
Um, iPhone 12 Pros allow you to shoot raw in night mode. So you can be night mode and you get the benefit of all of that. It also takes advantage of the smart HDR and the deep fusion. All of those are saved in the raw file. Okay, there we go. So native editor, Snapseed. Let's pick a few uh, images for um, Snapseed here. I think we'll do uh, this particular image in Morro Bay. One of the nice things about Snapseed is it allows you to use the clipboard to bring images in and out of the application. Typically, if you go into an app to tweak something, what do you do? You go into the app, you say open, and then you start digging through your soft drawer of images, right? And you're looking at tiny little thumbnails, and sometimes it's almost impossible to go, well, was it this one or this one? So hopefully you're taking advantage of things like the heart at the bottom, Remember, that's what this is for. It'll automatically show. If I jump back, you'll see here that now I can go, if there are two similar images, I can go, oh, it was the one that I hearted or favorited. So hopefully you're doing that. As soon as you use that part, it also adds it to its own folder called favorites. So again, by all means, take advantage of this little heart favoriting thing. But even easier than that is if you come down to the share icon in the lower left, talking about how to get images into Snapseed, click on that and just simply say copy photo. Um, when you do that and then jump into Snapseed, and this is what the icon looks like, and tap on it and we'll say open in the upper left, you'll notice that because I copied something, I have paste as an option. I have paste and that's cool because I'm actually looking at a full resolution, full size image. And I go, this is the one I wanna work on. Just simply tap share, copy, go into Snapseed and I have my file, okay? Now this is an interesting thing in Snapseed and some of you may have never seen it before. This is known as the develop module inside of Snapseed. This is a raw file. This is actually a raw file coming from my big boy camera, okay? Probably coming from a Nikon, it's probably a NEF file. And um, it shows you that Snapseed works just great with raw files. Um, as you may know, Snapseed was actually invented by Nick Software, NIK Software down here in San Diego, it was bought by Google and they've continued to, to um, expand it great piece of software. What's underneath the hood in terms of its image processing is fantastic. If you've never used Snapseed before, basically how it works is if you press your finger inside the image and go up and down, you have all the options at your disposal, okay? If you find one that you would like to use like contrast, then you now go left and right to add or subtract any of that particular parameter, okay? So again, I'm actually doing an initial processing of a raw file inside of Snapseed. If you've never opened up a raw file in Snapseed, you will never find this develop option. This is actually demosaicing the raw file, turning it into something that can be edited. Okay, so we're gonna come up here, we're gonna add some saturation. They have structure, which again is like clarity, which is nice. So I can bring in some um, pop to the image for that, um, what's in the distance. And I have temperature and tint. So again, if I wanted to warm up the file slightly or even add a little bit of magenta cast for the afternoon. Okay. And we can zoom up. Okay, we have our histogram at the bottom. You can see I don't have any pure whites in here, but it's so subtle. If I were to come up here and actually change my exposure up, let's say, and then take my shadows down to increase contrast that way, hmm, not really crazy about it. I'm, I've got a bunch of different um, tonal correction options inside of Snapseed. So I'm gonna use that there. I'm not gonna to get too crazy. I do like my foreground. I do like that I'm getting this very graphic black um, foreground here. 
Okay, when I like um, what I've got, I can either in the lower left hit X and say, get me out of here, I don't want you to use this, or hit the checkbox and that will um, apply that particular edit. Which takes us to the main interface for Snapseed. This is the primary interface for um, Snapseed, where you have looks, which are their series of presets, including ones that you can make on your own. All the tools are at your disposal, which in this case is quite a few. A lot of these are targeted adjustments and your saving options. And the nice thing here um, for most um, smartphones is this ability to save with changes that can be undone. In other words, it saves over your original, completely non-destructive, um, not duplicating the file. So you end up with multiple files, but one original that has the raw file and all these changes added on top of it. You can do the same thing with save a copy. It maintains it. You can change anything at any time, maintains the um, original unchanged and you've made a copy or you can export it where it cooks everything in much as if you had saved a TIFF or something out of Photoshop. Okay. So again, you've got a handout with my overview on how I like to use Snapseed. I'm going to do a couple images here, but right now I'm going to jump over to tools and you'll see right here, there's that raw develop. Since I opened up a raw file, I have this as an option. I can jump back in and re-tweak those settings, which is great. You've got tune image, which is similar to the raw, but this is where most people would start that don't have access to raw. Your detail for sharpness and structure. You do have curves, white balance, crop, rotate, perspective. You can expand the image like Photoshop where you can actually add to it. We'll automatically retouch using um, um, a smart fill technology, it can expand that area. You can do a selective adjustment. This is what's known as the U-point technology that's been built into the Nick software for some time. You can brush in local adjustments. You can heal elements in it. You've got a nice healing brush here. And then you've got a series, a couple of things here. I'm gonna just mention this one right here, HDR scape, tonal contrast and drama. These three are what are known as LCEs or local contrast enhancements. Any um, photo editor worth anything are gonna have some sort of LCEs, local contrast enhancements. Clarity inside of Photoshop and Lightroom is a local contrast enhancement. Dehaze is a local contrast enhancement. Um, detail. All these different things, and technically uh, a um, high pass filter is a local contrast enhancement. It's taking a certain diameter um, along an edge and lightening and darkening either edge. And if you do something like tonal contrast, that is a very fine uh, LCE. I'm gonna press and hold and I get a before, after, before, after. Tonal contrast is excellent. It's wonderful. I think it's better than anything that's inside of Lightroom in terms of this pop. It's, it's better than the detail and um, that's in there. It's just a wonderful local contrast enhancement. It's very fine. These settings that you have here, 30, 50, 30, um, are excellent. I wouldn't muck about with these. You're not gonna get a significantly better um, result. Just accept these defaults right here, hit it, and then hit the checkbox, and you've done it. You've got this wonderful, um, as, a, as they call it, a tonal contrast, this one right here. HDR scape and drama are using a much larger radius. So I'm going to go up here, and I'm going to go to HDR scape, and you will see that Again, tapping to get a before and after, I'm getting a much larger sphere of influence. It's not just edges, it's actually making the entire area pop. You'll also notice that these you can uh, play around with if you'd like, brightness and saturation, whatever you'd like, filter strength, okay? 
you can see it's having an effect on the inherent um, vignetting in here where it's trying to brighten up some shadow areas. The great thing is you go, gosh, well, I love what it's doing on the wet sand, but I don't like what it's in on maybe on the hills. I don't like what it's doing to the sky in the foreground. Every single thing inside of Snapseed can be targeted to a specific area, which I'm going to show you in just a second. But this is called HDR scape. I want to show you another one that I also like. So I hit the X to back out of there without applying it. And then going back in here, again, that was HDR scape. Now I'm going to go into drama. And I mentioned there are three LCEs that I just love. HDR scape, tonal contrast, which I use on almost every image, and then drama. Drama up here has a whole series of presets. Not only does it have two parameters, a filter strength and a saturation, which it automatically desaturates, but it also has, if you look down here, a little swatch book, and those gives you different presets with whether you want to basically brighten the image and or, or whether you want to darken it and how exaggerated you want to have it. So I'm going to, in this case, I'm going to use drama one. I'm going to take that saturation back up. And then here's my before and after. So you can see this is much more like the dehaze built into Lightroom um, or Adobe Camera Raw. So there's my, I like my foreground. I like some of the mountains, but I don't like what it's doing to the very top. But I like it enough that knowing that I have a targeted adjustment, I'm going to say, okay, I'm gonna hit the little checkbox down here. And now I'm gonna show you another tip, which is how to do targeted adjustments of any adjustment inside of Snapseed. And for that, I'm gonna go up here, this little icon, which is, looks like layers with an arrow going back. So this is your view edits. And down here, you can undo what you did. You can revert to how you brought it in, or you can view edits. And this is mind-bogglingly powerful. This is not inside of Lightroom or ACR. There are targeted adjustments, but those are limited. This, any single thing that you do inside of Snapseed, you can do view edits. It will show you that I've done the develop I did a tonal contrast and I did drama. It shows you every single step that you've done. And you also have a little teeny carrot right here, a little teeny pop out arrow. And when you click on that, it says that I can fine tune the adjustments that I did, even if I did them a month ago. I can throw away this entire adjustment or I can mask the adjustment. So in this case, I can come up here, click on the mask, and now it's asking me to brush in the effect that I would like. If you look down here, you'll notice a drama 100. As a default, if I were to paint right now, it would be 100% of that drama. But these arrows allow me to fine tune the opacity of this brush, which is this drama adjustment. So I'll start it at 100%. There's a little eye down here so I can actually see what I'm painting. And if I come up here, I can come up and paint that. If I turn off the eye, I can see that I have painted in the drama to this portion of the file. Okay, I'm gonna remove that by going to zero, that's my eraser. And now I'm gonna come in and let's say that I want maybe uh, 50% overall, even going up to the bottom of part of my sky. Maybe 25 at the top here. And I'm going to add a little bit more as it comes down to the surfers. And now I've got this subtle gradation <laughs> of drama from full strength here to subtle, even including the sky and down here. So this one simple thing called view edits, and I'm gonna hit the checkbox and say, okay, allows me to do any kind of edit in a targeted fashion inside of Snapseed. Okay, I can go back. There's what it looked like with the develop. 
there is tonal contrast and there's drama. And when you're done, when you're done with view edits, this little arrow here takes you back to the main interface. Where did I find the view edits? It was this icon right here. It looks like layers with a backwards arrow. Clicking on that brings up view edits where anything that you do inside of um, Snapseed can be fine tuned. Okay, if I wanted to brighten up the area around the surfers, I could go into tune image, find brightness, come up here, okay, maybe even a little more saturation, highlights, I want a little bit more contrast. I hit the checkbox, okay, and again, click up on the view edits, click on the mask icon, and just come up here. And you can't change the size of the brush um, except by zooming in or out. If you zoom out, you have basically a beautiful gradient that you can brush in anywhere, or you can zoom in and you can fine tune the edit to just the surfboard. So that's how you change the size of the brush. In this case, I just wanna come up here and I'll just paint it over the surfers. And now I've got this um, better contrast of the surfers and their background. So develop, tonal contrast, drama, and a little tune image. Okay, we could do, I could easily do a, a week long seminar just on Snapseed. It is fantastic, it's awesome. I absolutely love it. Um, but I'll just leave it at that and then export, I will save a copy out, which will include all those edits. I will mention one thing, this looks, which I think is fantastic, it's the presets. Let me go ahead and we're gonna do that same thing where I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna find a raw file and I'm gonna copy it. Remember, this is how I love going into Snapseed. Go to the share icon, tap copy photo. Oh, by the way, you do know, hopefully you all know that when Apple got rid of the home button on the iPhones since the 11, this little bar down here is actually is an icon, is a button. When you shift this bar, it will cycle you through all your open applications. Since I'm in the camera roll now, but I was just in Snapseed, when I'm in the camera roll and I simply swipe on that little icon, it takes me directly to my last application. You don't have to go back to your quote unquote desktop, the home page, and then relaunch the app. Anything that you've been using is there. You can just swipe back and forth between your open apps. Okay, and then I go to my open icon, do my paste. I can do my um, basic develop here. Again, I'm gonna start with that temperature and tint. And you can see it's a much better sepia in here. I can come up here with my exposure. I have my highlights. And I can add, uh, don't need structure, add contrast. Okay. So that's the basic develop, but I've created under these looks, there are all these ones, portrait, smooth, pop, that they recommend that do all sorts of things. As I come down here, you'll notice it stops being a representation of the scene and now starts becoming little graphic elements um, of other images that I have worked on that I've saved a preset for. So I can actually come over here and it's gonna add these different recipes, these different formulas that I've created for other infrared images. And I'll say, I like that one and hit the checkbox. If I go to that view edits, you'll see that this recipe has curves, a glamor glow, drama, details, and a vignetting all added to that file. 
So the point here is that if you ever do anything inside of Snapseed that you like and you want to save it, you simply come down to looks, go to the far right, hit that plus sign, and it allows you to name it. And now you've got your own custom preset, which is going to dramatically speed up your workflow. Okay, make sense? Nod your head enthusiastically, those of you who I can see. Okay. So um, let's do a um, quick question. We'll take a little, little bit of a break, so to speak, before we jump into Lightroom. Questions related to either the native editor or Snapseed. And this is where Karen can um, unmute um, everybody for a second. Jack? Yes. Um, you skipped ambience. Any, any statement about that? Um, in terms of um, so let's jump back into here and let's actually undo that edit there. Um, tools. So ambiance is um, both a highlight and shadow. So as you come up here, you'll notice that it's darkening the highlights and lightening the shadows. If you add it, if you do a negative, much like um, clarity inside of um, ACR and Lightroom, you can add a anti-clarity or anti-ambiance. So it is going to uh, darken highlights, lighten shadows, or the opposite if you are removing it. Um, it can kind of flatten the file, um, but in this case, you can see that I'm, if I want to add just a little bit more um, shadow detail without the potential of blowing out highlights, it's very nice. Um, I like ambiance. Uh, again, um, if I were to go through um, each one of these tools and all the options and parameters and <laughs> swatches in each one of them, I'll, I, and again, that's what's in that page, some of the things that I like in there. Um, Glamour Glow is nice. This is an Orton effect. That's not, there is no equivalent inside of Lightroom or um, ACR. Um, these uh, vintage grainy film retro lugs and grunge are all great little antiquing ones. I might as well do one here um, since I've got it. So you can come up here and add a little uh, sepia tone effect to it, or let's actually go for teaching purposes, we'll go straight to grunge. Grunge has um, literally hundreds and hundreds of little styles. And these have um, things like uh, texture. So you can have a, um, a scratch and dust and scratches kind of look to it. You can fine tune your saturation. Um, we don't need that much contrast. So you can do these, you know, radical, uh, uh, stylized effects. The grunge is the most exaggerated of those. Um, and it also, when you come down here to the bottom, you can change the type of texture that is being used for this particular overlay. And as within all the styles, if you don't want to do this up, down, left, right um, thing to get to a particular um, setting, clicking down here in the bottom <coughs> will allow you to automatically see what your options are. And then you can just come up here and um, fine tune it. <coughs> um, and you can just randomize it. This little uh, arrows down here in the lower left just allows you to tap and get you know all sorts of different fun things on it. Um, last, it's got a very nice black and white, which uses all the color filters on it. Noir is also black and white. Um, portrait mode can do skin softening and uh, eye brightening, which is nice. Head pose is creepy as most things that allow you to change the position of a head after the fact. Lens blur is nice. That's not a true shallow depth of field, but it's nice to do a kind of a pinhole camera. Vignette, double exposure, text and framing. These are nice because we all like sending little teeny notes to people for their birthdays. So coming up here and clicking on text allows you to automatically come up here and add you know, a little text and happy birthday and thinking of you. Okay, that's a quick overview of Snapseed. Any other question?
A couple of people asked about the develop mode. Is that only for raw files? It's only for raw files. You will only see that develop module. Um, one, if you open up a raw file, you have to go through there. As you probably know, a raw file actually doesn't contain pixels. It's raw sensor data. You cannot edit a raw file. It has to be what's, what's called demosaic. It has to be turned from sensor data into pixel data. So that um, first step of develop tells it how it's going to uh, demosaic the file and turn it into pixels. Um, so that's the only time you'll see it. And um, yeah. Jack, I have a question. When you're selecting, like on that surfing scene and making selections, are you using your finger or a stylus? I'm using my finger for everything I've done so far. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, a stylus is good. Um, when I edit, I mean, I like to edit on my iPad um, whenever possible. And for that, I use an Apple Pencil, which is excellent. Rotation, I mean, it's, it's actually, I can't say better than a Wacom because I love the people at Wacom too much, but it is ridiculously good in terms of rotation, tilt, um, pressure sensitivity. So if I do need to do a lot of retouching, I'll do it on my iPad with an Apple Pencil. Good question. Okay, um, Lightroom. Again, we could easily do a month long class as I often do on Lightroom and its counterpart, uh, Adobe Camera Raw. Remember the engine that powers Lightroom, whether it's Lightroom CC or Lightroom Classic is exactly the same engine on both of those. And it's exactly the same engine as in Adobe Camera Raw built into the bridge and Photoshop as a filter. So every single thing related to how you do a workflow in any three of these applications, Lightroom CC, Lightroom Classic, or Adobe Camera Raw works exactly the same. So this is a kind of a quick and dirty overview of how I particularly um, edit files inside of Lightroom. And so um, with that, I'm just going to kind of um, explain um, what is uh, on screen here. And then I'll do a couple images. And um, actually, I can't do that because I want you to be able to see the icons. <clears throat> um, so um, copy, paste, settings, and create apply presets. Just like looks inside of Snapseed, you have presets built into um, uh, Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. They are this icon here. There's no reason in the world for you to start from scratch on any image ever. There, you know, at least if you took it during the daylight, you probably, and it's a landscape, you probably have your favorite sharpening settings, right, under detail. Um, you probably have favorite noise reduction settings. You probably have all sorts of things that you could have, even not related to the optimizing of that particular image. Um, save it as a preset. There's no reason in the world that, you know, daytime landscape isn't a preset for you. So you can automatically get rid of the uh, adjustment of your sharpening and noise reduction, maybe adding a profile. Um, maybe you always hit auto and a little bit of clarity and you bring your shadows up and your highlights down. Whatever you do, turn it into a preset. And again, if it's say landscape daylight, as opposed to morning or evening, landscape daylight, um, open up your five favorite daytime landscapes, do a tweak on each one of those slightly different and call those landscape one, two, three, four, five. That way, when you open up a landscape, you just hover your cursor over those presets, click on number three, and you're done. You've just done all your edits. You've done all your sharpening. You've gotten at least 90% of the way there. So if you're not using presets, do it. Um, we'll see if we can touch on that. Auto, auto, if you haven't used auto in a while, auto is fantastic. It is much better than it has been in the past. It's using machine learning, um, a type of artificial intelligence from Adobe. There's Sensei technology as they call it. 
um, by all means, take advantage of auto um, inside of Lightroom. I then jump down into effects, which is odd, as opposed to light. Okay, you'll notice the order effects before light. Why is that? Because effects are where the LCEs are, local contrast enhancements. This is where your contrast on your edges are all going to be found. Clarity is kind of medium. Dehaze is your largest sphere of influence. Texture is your finest. Um, small little detail texture, which is excellent. And uh, vignette, in a sense, is a type of LCE in the sense that you're able to darken up your edges or lighten them up. Um, if you do any of these, do these before you do your light settings, because if you get carried away with dehaze, because it's doing a real pop to a hazy image, if you do that after you've done your shadow and highlights, guess what? As soon as you do dehaze, you're going to have to go back and refine tune your shadow and highlights. What you want to do is come up with a workflow where you're not jumping back and forth and redoing the same adjustment more than once. That makes sense. Um, so by doing your LCEs first, then you can come up here, especially if you've hit auto, because your auto is automatically going to do a basic setting of all your different light um, settings, shadow, highlight, exposure, and blacks. I include contrast. So um, I go from auto to effects to light. Color, you always want to have your color be further down in your workflow because every time you change your contrast, which is what you just did here, you by definition are changing your color in your file. If you just jump right into Vibrance and pop it up, as soon as you get your contrast where you want it, you'll probably have to refine tune something like Vibrance again, because you probably got too carried away. You should usually get your color done by getting the correct contrast and then fine tune it, including your white balance and saturation. Then you go into your selective edits. I recommend starting with the ovals. They're nice, big, soft, easy to, excuse me, move around. You're doing these nice dodge and burns. If you remember this, the old days of the dark room, what did we have? We had paddles, right? That we would wave in front of the enlarger. And we would use that to dodge and burn certain areas in, holes in paddles. And that's what the ovals are kind of like. I like that. Optics and detail, where you're going to get your sharpening, remove chromatic aberration. That's what the CA is. And then seven, you can do your retouching, healing brush. Remember, when you heal, it's automatically blending, and you want a low feather because it does the blending automatically. If you clone, there is no blending as a default, so you will need a high feather, OK? That's why I gave you this little cheat sheet as part of those little um, uh, documents that we started off the evening with and we'll finish off the evening with so you can have access to this. OK, so with that, let me go into Lightroom and just um, tweak a couple images based upon that seven-step tango. Okay, so let's do this one. I won't say whose friend's house this is, but it's a world-renowned Photoshop. I'll tell you because you can't find it because I'm not giving you this image. This is Ben and Karen Wilmore's house. Ben Wilmore, who uh, co-author of mine in the How to Wow books and Digital Mastery, a phenomenal uh, Photoshop teacher. This is his disgustingly gorgeous house, gallery, yoga studio, and I won't tell you where it is. Um, so uh, presets, I had mentioned uh, presets and let's kind of, I got to move over. There we go. I was blocking my own screen. Um, so uh, in the first, 
and I'm going to go this way because it gets really confusing really quick. So um, we have our auto here. And for some reason, auto. Oh, I already tapped it. So it is grayed out. So here's our before, after, auto. Anytime you see a little dot underneath any of these little adjustments, it means that it automatically did something. So when I hit auto, it automatically did all my light settings and color settings. Okay, so step one is auto. Um, let's actually, let's come down here to our presets because it could be that, as I mentioned to you before, we're gonna go to general tweak. So there's general tweak, zero, two, three, four, five. You get a little preview. Let's say that we like general tweak um, six. Here's my before, after, before, after. You can see how much highlight detail has been brought in, how much shadow detail has been brought in. That's how you should be doing your workflow. You come up with a landscape, you come up to something general tweak, you have an IR, you have a portrait, you come up with your favorites, and then you simply hit the checkbox. I'm gonna hit X and not apply it so we can do it from scratch. Um, but basically, once you've done a tweak, as this already has a basic tweak to it, in the upper right-hand corner, our little ellipse, dot, 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 Clicking on that is your great preset. And you can name it and put it in any kind of category that you would like. So that's how you create presets inside of um, Lightroom. So we've hit auto. We're gonna go into our effects. I'm gonna do a little bit of texture because I know I like that. A little bit of clarity because I know I like that. I don't, I can do the dehaze because that's gonna add you know, a lot of detail to my sky but it's probably not doing a whole lot of uh, benefit to my shadows. But that's again why I go ahead and do it before I go to my light settings. And I can add a little bit of negative vignette just to draw the eye in from the hot corners in the lower left-hand side. My next one is light. This is where I'm gonna come up here. And you'll notice that all the settings have already been adjusted because I hit auto. I'm gonna go into shadow which is really the main thing that I need to do. Um, and I may go into that black point. Remember I told you how important black is in the native camera editor. Because I'm using dehaze and even a little bit of clarity, that's adding um, some darkness to my shadows. And um, in other words, the minus 12 blacks that it did when I hit auto isn't actually necessary because I'm using other things that add this local contrast enhancement, LCE. So I can come up here and I can actually add um, to that black point without muddying up my shadow detail because I have gotten that nice crisp shadows from using something else like dehaze or clarity, okay? So pressing on the screen, there's my before, after before, after, that's my light. I can go over here to color. Um, I do have vibrance, really it's already, as you can see, once I set my contrast, I really don't need to add more vibrance to it. As radioactive as I often make my images, get your contrast right and your vibrance will follow. Okay, you'll notice the new grading that has now been added that came in with our latest updates on all the versions of um, Lightroom, as well as color mixing, as well as black and white. Okay, hopefully you all know that this is a great way to do black and white. And um, basically you come up here, go into black and white, and then you just tap with the little eyedropper right here. And then whatever you click and drag on, it's going to um, allow you to white
and it's something with the interface is going on right now, which is not how you want to do a demo. But uh, and grading, if you have not played around with the different grading options of highlights, midtones, shadows, and it, um, it is uh, excellent. It has replaced the um, duotone mode of just highlights and shadows. They've added the midtones. It works very similar to it in terms of how you can um, work on a file. Um, again, I'm not going to elaborate on it just because of our time and the other apps that we're going to get to. Um, so that is color and then selective edits. If we wanted to, again, selective edits are over here on the far left. Click on that. The plus up here is where you add a new one. We have our brush, radial, and gradient. We'll just do a little graduated ND quickly. Jump over here to the gradient drag down, we automatically get our little red preview of where we're um, affecting. Come up here, and now we have at our disposal all the adjustments associated with the targeted adjustments, such as light, and we can come up here and add our little graduated ND effect. What's missing is you don't have um, an ability to adjust this mask um, with a luminance mask that's built into the desktop versions of Lightroom and ACR, which is a real shame. There is no way to um, adjust that aside from actually erasing a portion of the image. So that's one feature on the mobile versions that has not come over from the desktop yet. But again, click, add another one. We'll do another one here from the bottom, click on it, and we can again, take our exposure down. So here's our before, after, before, after. There's a um, basic on Lightroom. If I wanted to, as I said, I could save this as a preset. Okay. And then let's see if we can um, just do some of these fun ones. I've purposely kind of canned these um, to make them as good as possible. So one of the ones that um, I love, um, in terms of retouching is touch retouch. Fantastic. You can actually access it if you buy it, touch retouch. Um, when you edit a photo in the native editor, actually up here in the upper right, you may have noticed this little ellipse up here, which again is give me more information. So when I click on that, you'll notice these options, one of which is markup, where you can, hopefully you've been using that for your PDFs, where you can add notes and text and all sorts of things. But if you scroll down, there is touch retouch. Okay. So I just simply, and they ran out of room, so they just call it retouch. It's actually called touch retouch. And now I'm inside of touch retouch. And one of the really cool things that it has in addition to object removal and quick repair and clone stamp is it has line removal, something that's still not built into Photoshop. So if I come up here to line removal and just do a vaguely sketch along the lower right, let me go actually, there's an undo, let me get the settings, we'll do a little bit bigger. So I'm just gonna take my finger and roughly draw that you can see it's nowhere near following that line and let go. And it automatically did that line. This line right here, crossing over some very important information, if I just drag, it retouches that. If I go up here and there and there and there and my before and after, okay? Very nice, nothing else has it, very, very cool. If I cancel out of there and do this one, the other feature that it has, again, I'm in the native editor, upper right-hand corner, go over to uh, touch retouch. By the way, every edit that you do in here is non-destructive. It adds it on top of the original and you can always hit revert in the native editor and get back to your original. So now clone stamp. Um, 
lot of editors do not have a clone stamp. All they're doing is a type of healing. If I come up here, this is an infrared uh, taken outside of Ankar Watt, and I want to get rid of that bus. Okay, let's actually come up here and do a, a quick repair. This is how most editors, including Snapseed and other ones, work. It kind of does it, but not really, because you're not really telling it. It's it's you're not giving it direction. It's just trying to its best to figure out what to do. What you want to be able to do is come up here and do a clone stamp and say, I want you to tap and I want you to then use that to do my retouching. And that way it actually will automatically align since I'm choosing where that alignment is taking place. I can actually come up here and do a pretty gosh darn. And again, this is with my finger on an iPhone, not even using a stylus. So there's before and after. So a clone stamp is an incredibly useful, as we all know, we've been using it inside of Photoshop for a million years. It's built into the native editor, which is where I'm at right now, right? So again, I'll cancel out of that. So I've got that sample still at, um, at my disposal. That's Touch Retouch. We used the Face app um, last week. Um, it's disgustingly um, fun. This was the original that we shot last week as part of the class. There is a much better file. It's gotten Bit of the um, nose because of the wide angle of a selfie. Again, I'm holding the camera out like this. So it's um, tightened up the uh, distortion in the center of the face, got rid of the little bit of the bags under the eyes, um, added a little bit of shadow down here for my gel line. Again, it's ridiculous. It's an app called Faces. And of course, then you can get really crazy with um, everything else that it has at its disposal. This is what I shared with you last week. And uh, also, good friend, and how far you can push it. This is my friend, Tim. And uh, again, adding the glasses, removing hair, adding hair, uh, you get the idea. It is an excellent app. What is the interface? I am using this friend. This was a wonderful Buddhist monk. We had a great time um, hanging out and we did this together. So he was not offended at all. He actually loved it that um, we could come up here and um, actually give him a smile um, and add it to the equation. So there is before, after. It's a very natural looking um, smile. There's a little bit even bigger. I mean, look at the, what it's doing to the cheek muscles. That's just absolutely crazy. You can apply it. We can give him a little, you know, groovy goat. Let's, let's, let's give him, again, we were just having a great, great time here. So again, I, I know that he was not, I'm offended. But we'll give him some glasses. Yeah, I've seen. Okay, so that is uh, faces. I wouldn't pay for it. a lot of these. Have you know? You can add on you know uh, new features. Most of these download these ones, play with them, use the free version of them, and only if you go, I'm going to be you know using this um, on a regular basis. Would um, you know? Would I think about actually uh, paying for it? The most part, I would not. Okay, you get the you get the general idea. That is faces. This one right here. Remini, I mentioned before. I'll just show you some samples. 
Um, it's a free app. It does free, it does five free edits a day, as long as you watch these silly little cartoon ads. But what it does is miraculous. Um, you can actually pay for it a, a subscription. It's not cheap. But um, as an example, a uh, picture of my parents, old, you know, some five by seven million years old, and then running it through Remini. That is just freakishly amazing. And it's doing this through all artificial intelligence. It's a combination of machine learning and AI where it's fed in so many hundreds of thousands of images that it knows that this image here should look like this image here. So again, here to here, I actually have the application open. Let's see if it stayed open. There we go. So there is before, that's the original. That's what it had to work with, nothing more. That's what it came up with. People have been burned at the stake for less than what this application does. And again, it lets you do five a day, just make a folder of images that you want to use all your old family ones and uh, and be prepared to watch stupid little um, advertisements. Absolutely fantastic. Okay. Um, Procos, what happens if you're shooting something and you don't have the ability to um, shoot in portrait mode? Um, this happened to be have been uh, taken in portrait mode, but I want to blur that background or let's say you know, Let's do this one. Not a great shot, but I know that if I can emphasize the flower, it will be um, a, a nicer story. So I'm going to come up here and focus this one right here. Okay is an amazing app. And see if I can find that one. The, I, the iPhone, when you go into this, this is another reason why I don't like digging through the sock drawer of you know because they're not they're not in order we'll just use this one of these so there is no depth information in this file and yet it is able to if i tap on the background blur my foreground tap on the flower automatically give me a razor sharp edge with no hand detailing and give me my shallow depth of field that I want for my story. Focus, it's awesome, it's fantastic. Any image, no matter what it was taken with, when it was taken, will add the depth effect to it. It is excellent. It's called Focus. There's 50 million settings at the bottom. Don't even worry about it. Just change your aperture size and be done with it. It's Focus. I absolutely love it. It takes into account the foreground and background um, situation. So um, it automatically in something like this, you'll notice the tire where it hits the ground, the asphalt is in focus and it gradually goes back behind the uh, bar. It really does an amazing job of adding the depth effect to it. Okay, that is Focus. We're coming up here. And Photoshop camera. I think I've also already loaded that. Nope. Oh, we'll use this one. Our uh, you go into lenses, you can shoot with this. This is from Adobe. It's a free app. 
but it allows you to do um, amazing stuff where again, with no depth information, it automatically figures that out using machine learning and AI and lets you create truly bizarre things, entities. It's meant for young people with way too much time on their hand and uh, you can pretend to be one of those. So again, pressing and holding. This is the shot I took in London, exactly as it was. It's automatically changing, it's grading, it's using a lookup table to match the sky to the foreground and add in a new sky. And I'm just simply swiping through these options. In case your friends have told you that they took this shot in London and you know it's won all sorts of awards, Never believe them ever again. Everything that you see is all a lie. There is no true photography ever, ever uh, again. Everything is a lie. You get the idea. Okay, so this is, and you can actually, now they've changed it. It's even more powerful. This little arrow in the top, you can click on it and actually move the different elements around. And you can see this automatic mass that it's doing to, uh, to combine it and freak out your friends, you know. Okay. And there's some practical ones, some instant film, monochrome, nice vintage. You get the idea. It's actually extremely creative and uh, Adobe has done a great job on it. It's, it's more for fun, but play around with it. The topic last week and this week was how far computational photography is being pushed. And this is certainly one of those things that is a part of it. Okay, and then we'll do this one. This is kind of a, a one trick pony, RNI Arrow. This is a company that does a lot of presets and profiles. But if you do like infrared, um, but don't wanna play around with it, you can actually get what's known as a super color infrared look by um, getting this app and just clicking on one of these. These first five are free. Um, the other ones um, can get quite expensive if you do that. But um, it's not a bad um, version of what's known as a super color infrared shot where the Flora is going to go to the magentas and warms, leaving the skies blue. Um, so that is called RNI Arrow. And then DreamScope. DreamScope is a painting app, or I should say paint cloning app. And it is phenomenal. It's the best set of all the um, cloning apps because you can tell it what you would like it to use for a, um, a source file. Now there are other apps that are claiming that, but they're really not. They're really not um, doing it. So as an example, if I go here and I go, I would like you to use um, this photograph right there for the painting of this image, it will take that painting, which I took of a oil painting in Russia, and or I do my own paintings or watercolors or sketches, and then you take a photograph of it and say, turn this photograph into this sketch. Um, I kind of like this right here, as you're waiting for it to happen, because it does take a while. I like this, if I, if I press and hold, here's the original that somebody else did. Lay Layla69 did this. With a custom filter, she did it from a photograph 13 hours ago. I let go, this is the result. I don't know what she used as a source that's hidden, but you'll notice there's a little try filter right here. If I hit try filter, I can go to um, my albums and find my source file. We'll Tap 
you as a default, they're all shared publicly, much like that little bird picture. That's why I could see it and why I could steal that kind of filter, so to speak. If you don't want, if you make it private, you click on the earth and it locks it and nobody will see your images or what you're doing and paint and post privately. Okay, I can click on other images here. You have to be careful because people can put any kind of image that they want up there. Um, if I go to the little hand, this was a friend's birthday a couple of days ago. So I was working on portraits, portraits of her. This right here are those two that it's working on. I'm gonna come down here, hit the camera. I'm gonna do one more. We'll see if any of them um, come up. And here and now you've got hundreds of presets down here at the bottom, um, including Van Gogh and all sorts of uh, actual famous works, as well as other ones that they like. So you don't have to use your own work, you can use theirs. Uh, I gave uh, in that little page I have on painting, which is another thing that I gave to you, that has uh, a bunch of my favorites that are already built in as presets. So um, paint and post. I'm now going to have three images. Rather than wait for that, I'll just come up here and look at DreamScope. And again, these are some samples of woodcuts, paintings, kind of like a, a scream alternate, watercolors, some um, sketches. You know, something, some that have a lot of impasto, the thick uh, wet on wet brush work. I mean, it can, it can grab anything. It really is uh, amazing what it's able to do. Um, and because you're using things like this as a source file um, to create a sketch, um, you will come up with things that nobody else has. They are totally yours, especially if you're um, not using somebody else's custom filter. So, um, and it doesn't have to be a painting or a drawing. It can be, you know, chrome or gold or cloisonne, which is what this is. Okay, or comic books, again, woodcuts, you get the idea. So those are some of the um, applications. These are the ones that we were just touching on. Um, I knew that it would go long again, but again, we recorded that. Go to that uh, jackdavishowtowow.com and uh, I'll make sure that you get a copy of tonight's thing so you can chew on it at your leisure. And remember to go to that tiny URL that we started off the um, night um, with that one right there at the bottom, that one right there, tinyurl.com slash Davis Chicago files, and then 12221 today's date. Go there and you'll get um, the links to all the free movies that I'm giving you and um, also the graphics that have the cheat sheet for um, Snapseed, some painting, uh, the seven step tango for Lightroom, et cetera, et cetera. As well as the invitation to Hawaii. If you've never been to the island of Molokai, it's Hawaii of a hundred years ago. And uh, it's just fantastic. I only do one workshop a year and it's to Molokai because I just love going back there. I've been doing it for about 20 years now. So with that, any questions before we let you guys pass out and do some happy hour in, uh, in some way, shape or form? Karen, you can turn back on any muting that is set. One quick, don't you need permission to go to Molokai? You need permission to pretty much go anywhere on the planet right now. Well, yeah. um, but in terms of Molokai versus any other outer island, no. Okay. Um, there was, uh, there have been things where certain cruise lines have come in without permission and those were turned away. 
and the locals at the beginning of the COVID thing were um, highly recommending that um, non-locals don't come in, which soon all the Hawaiian islands followed suit. So, but no, there's nothing specific about Molokai um, right now in terms of that. Um, the workshop isn't until November 5th. It's an eight day workshop. And so um, uh, Hawaii has already loosened up a lot of the requirements. And of course, we're hoping that by that time, um, there will be um, all the um, restrictions will be lifted. So that is the um, plan. Hey, Other Jack, question? Jack? Yes, you, you, Mr. Uh, Warrior. Your, your last time you handed out something, an app called Polycam, and it disappeared. I did have Polycam on there. The uh, Polycam, because I was talking about um, computational photography, I added Polycam in there, and um, it's right here. And it allows you to take a, a 3D scene. The problem is, is that I'm in a studio that's not worthy of a 3D scene. Um, but as you can see here, it's actually creating 3D models of everything that it looks at. And so it's used for creating a augmented reality 3D model of any um, scene. Typically it would be an interior. Uh, and that is not only the 3D model, but a texture map applied to that 3D model. So there's probably half a dozen different applications that um, are taking advantage of um, specifically the LiDAR sensor in the new iPhone 12 Pros. That's what it's using to do its, its magic. Um, a lot of these apps will work with the older iPhones, the 11s and any of the 12s, but it's really the LiDAR sensor that is allowing for this amazing ability to um, send out lasers into an environment and at a minute level, um, know everything about it. Every distance, every measurement, everything about that environment uh, in terms of its composition and color um, can be added, uh, can be recorded. The other thing that um, is nice for this one, Polycam is it also um, has um, it also has the ability to do a regular good old fashioned 3D uh, panorama. Oh, so okay. you can do it and it does uses the LIDAR to do an interior 3D pano, um, which is nice. Um, so what, pro what, what software do you need to take this the next step? To well, do it depends. There's, it, it comes off, the free version of it does some fairly elaborate ones and you can do a fairly quick one where it'll render it and then you can say do an enhanced one and it will go ahead and, and take some time and chew on it and get rid of uh, extraneous polygrams, uh, polygons and stuff. And But if you need something that would actually be used in some sort of carpentry or design work, then they'll charge you for it, but it actually would be a, you know, a CAD based file. Um, okay. But it, it's, it's outputting, even on the free version, it'll output a, a basic CAD file. Uh, I couldn't tell you what, um, at this moment, what the uh, basic uh, options are. It's really the level of detail and accuracy um, is what you're paying for if you need more information from it. Yeah, but can, can you bend the output of the basic uh, app um, and, and put it into Photoshop and print it? Um, well, it's, it's making a graphic file. Um, you actually would stand in, typically you'd stand in the center of a room, move ever so slightly so you're not looking from the exact same point because it's actually can look around corners, right? As right. it's trying to make its 3D model. Um, and, uh, and then I if you're talking it about today, bringing it's... it into Photoshop as a 3D model, yes, you can. Um, I would expect that the texture map is gonna um, come in applied as well. But um, how far you can take it from that, remember, because it's not, it's doing it from one primary location. So everything is, is being looked at from one primary area. As an example, if you're shooting a bedroom and there's something behind the bed, like a table, uh, a little bedside table, and you can't see it, it can't record it. It's not creating a, a 3D map of a space um, in something that it can't see. So there are limitations to it. 
Um, probably there are apps that would let you walk around in a room and it would keep track of all the anchor points of say all the corners of the room. So as you walked around, you could look around the bed and it could create that. Uh, uh, there, there, there's, the the, Jack, there's a demo on Facebook where a guy did that with Polly, Polly Kim today. I mean, okay. I saw it today. I mean, I was trying to figure out what the hell is this thing, but yeah, it's awesome. You walked Again, around. I, I it was one of the first ones to do some, you know, very usable stuff in uh, with the uh, advent of the iPhone 12. So I'm still kind of new on it. Um, well, I've experimented with it. Looks great. There are probably half a dozen ones that are doing some similar things, including ones that you walk around a person and it will do a 3D model of that person and texture map their, you know. Uh, Wow. features onto the 3D model it creates. And then you can bring that into things like Photoshop. Okay. So yeah, the idea of using augmented reality based tools, specifically things that take advantage of the LiDAR sensor on the iPhone, um, we're just scratching the surface. Oh. Uh, give it another six months and there'll be some truly um, mind bending stuff out there. Th this already is, you know. So. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. sir. Good seeing you. You're, you're, you're welcome, good seeing you. Any other questions? I do, Jack. Hi, it's yeah. Alicia. I haven't seen you in a really long time. How are you? Hi, Alicia. Um, I can't see you, but I hear your voice. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, great presentation. I have a question on Remini. Um, is, is that I'm how you dealing pronounce with the, it? I, I don't know if it's how you pronounce it. I just, I, I okay. think, I don't know, Remini, but um, Remini, yep. Remini, okay. Remini um, you know, a glass of wine doesn't hurt. <laughs> so, you know, with uh, trying to archive some of family photos I'm finding some of the photos that I have that I'm trying to archive have been scanned photos and there are um, natural lines going through them do you have any experience with how that app might heal those lines that are in those copies of scanned photos or is that it's something interesting so here uh, is one of me with a really attitude and heavy halftone um, dot uh, pattern on it. And here it did a great job, but you'll notice down in the shirt, it wasn't able to get rid of the halftone or it tried. And on certain ones, it does the face, but it does not um, get rid of the artifacting. I don't have a, another sample here. Um, so again, blurry, but so to answer your question, it, um, is working on the faces. And so it'll try its best to get rid of the, like the, a lot of, uh, the, uh, prints, uh, real old prints had a texture to the paper, um, un the uncoated stock of, of old, you know, sepia prints. So it'll do its best to get rid of the inherent texture, but it will do it in the face, not necessarily in the background. Um, so there can be some odd things. What I would probably recommend doing, and I've done this on some, is um, keep your original that has all the textures and artifacts in it, do a remini um, on it and pull in as much detail as you can and things like the face bring those two together inside of Photoshop and then mask in certain areas where you can bring in say 75% of the detail in the face and yet you're maintaining some of the inherent texture of the original. You've brought out and resuscitated the image but it still is a more natural than the Remini where it's gonna affect the face different than the background. So, awesome, awesome, um, thank you. That's what I've done in it it really is for what it's doing, you know, the free version is absolutely ridiculous. If you do the paid yeah. version, it can automatically hand tint black and white images. Oh, wow. Um, you know, it, it does a ton of stuff. So if you had one, I mean, you know, this is the business. You yeah. Don't, certainly don't tell somebody that this is a mobile app. You subscribe to it, get the whole thing, right. offer your services <laughs> for, you know, $100 an hour and knock yourself out. Um, I don't recommend you do this because I should be doing it myself because uh, I'm not smart enough to do that. It, it's yep. an amazing, it's an amazing app. And there's a number of, of apps that do that. That Faces app, uh, I wish it did a little bit more high resolution, 
actually does a ridiculously good job of doing, um, you know, portrait retouching. The new Photoshop, the uh, 2021 version of Photoshop released in October um, is adding more and more um, machine learning AI portrait retouching features, uh, which you've probably seen. So we're gonna be seeing a lot more of this sort of stuff um, in the near future. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Any other yeah. questions? Yes. If, if um, you have something that has like faded uh, handwriting, would Remini bring that out? No, it's strictly for uh, faces. That's where it did all its machine learning was um, based upon faces. Um, that would be if it's faded text, it's just gonna be working with your tonal controls inside of Lightroom to be able to pull out, um, you know, things like you can add your, uh, take your black point up, which will um, get all your darkest darks. And then you can actually take your exposure up as well. Um, you know, a black point down, uh, exposure up to try and get the contrast that you need. Of course you have curves. Um, curves are nice because remember you've got a sampler, what they call the targeted adjustment tool. So you can click on the text and go down to darken it, go to the background and go up to lighten it. Um, all sorts of things that you can do, use it in concert with the um, texture um, um, situation, uh, the uh, texture inside of um, Lightroom or ACR to bring in some more detail and something that's fuzzy. But Remini is just strictly for faces. It will not, it will not fix an old, you know, landscape. It'll just look at it and go, I don't even know what to do with it. So if your um, photo is is both faded and the color has changed, it'll bring it back. Is it that right? can. Uh, I've done specifically just the enhancing of detail. Um, I have not used its um, auto recolor. There's a number of um, apps that um, let you um, will automatically recolor a black and white image. Let's see if I've got one here for you. There's one called Colorize that you can see here. Um, and it is unlimited color, you know, three days free or $6 a month. Um, there, it's a pup, there's uh, this algorithm, there's a group in Russia that came up with this great algorithm based upon machine learning of millions of um, hand tinted photographs. And, uh, and here's one that was hand tinted. Um, by the app automatically, a, a infrared picture. So um, there are, and if you actually Google um, um, recoloring black and white images or hand tinting black and white images, you'll find some of these free sites that allow you to do it, um, that'll do some nice hand tinting effects uh, for free um, via a, a browser page. Um, I have. But, this is my parents and it's the tone uh, has changed. It's magenta and, and it's faded slightly. So. Well, that, you that you can try turning it into a pure black and white and then hand tinting it. Um, if the colors have changed over time as they do, that's a kind of a different scenario um, because it, there is color there, they're just, just inaccurate because different colors fade at different um, amounts based upon the wavelength of light hitting the different you know, colors of the spectrum in the inks. So um, you may be best off to turn it into a black and white and then, you know, so to speak, hand tint it using one of the, some of the free um, uh, web browser options or try you know, the Remini. Okay. Jack, I have a Thanks. question about iMazing. Yes. Going back to last week. So yes. I downloaded it and I uh, backed up my phone and it has my photos and everything. But if I want to uh, delete a bunch of photos from my phone, um, does iMazing automatically sync that the next time I connect it? So, um, so what we're 
I'm talking about, we mentioned um, last week, and let me pull up the, uh, the interface for amazing. So when you sync, so when you um, sync a file and you just tell it to sync it, it does like the um, standard backup in iTunes. It, it's an encoded file. It takes everything on your phone and makes the backup. That means it can be restored in case you were to lose it or break your phone. Right. Um, the other thing that you can do, but that doesn't let you access particular photographs in it, either to back up or whatever. If you go into photos, it actually, in my case, it's gonna find all 5 million albums that I've created on my phone and I can go into a particular album. So here's all photos, cameras recently shared, you know, here's um, a class and I can continue down. Here's, you know, Grand Canyon. Um, so margaritas. <laughs> There are recipes, so you know some of us don't get out too much. So if I wanted to back up all these, I literally could drag this folder onto somewhere on my desktop and back it up. If I only wanted to take those, I could drag those and move them to somewhere on the desktop. Um, so to answer your question, if I'm using the built-in um, backup, it is syncing it. If I throw away some images and then sync it next week, that backup will have less photos on it because I threw some away. Those are synced. That's the definition of a backup. It's a mirror copy of whatever um, you are backing up. If you wanted things because you knew you wanted, I don't need these recipes for margaritas, right? I can literally take this folder, drop them onto my desktop. Apply it all. Um, copy them all, and then I could literally from here, I can delete them off and free up space on my phone. So that's what I would do if there are some images that I want to uh, take off my phone so I can free up space. That's really not part of the syncing procedure. It's part of me just saying this, 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 and this. I'm able to back up and then um, throw them away. When I next sync the phone, that sync will no longer have the margaritas because it's no longer on the phone. I'm manually backing up specific things to specific areas. I can actually take all these things, you know, and keep all the folder structure. And if I've got a nice, you know, cheap four terabyte drive from Costco, I can select everything, move it over, and every single photo album and every photograph that's on my phone is organized and set and available for me on my uh, desktop. That's why I, I like it. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, well, um, if, wait, Jack, somebody yes. had mentioned um, that one of um, the links that you shared isn't working. It was uh, a wow, how to wow link. So you might wanna check that. Um, a how to wow link. Well, let's go. We're take a look at those right now. Uh, Jack, before you leave this, yes. Did you have the iPhone up there on the top left because you plugged it into your computer? I'm sorry. My iPhone is plugged into the computer. You can also do it with iMazing over Wi Fi. Okay, so it doesn't need you. to be connected, but it is faster if you physically have it connected. Thank you. Good Amazing question. program. Thank you. Yeah. So um, in terms of this one right here, um, this one is the only one that has how to wow in it. So if this is supposedly the one not working, it's working. Okay. Um, and this is just saying put in your email and that way when I come up, since I won't be seeing you guys again until May, if you would like tonight's class, um, once I um, I'm able to download it and then re-upload it into um, YouTube so Fort Dearborn can um, throw it away off the cloud that they're paying for. I will send everybody an email with the link to tonight's class. So it appears to be working fine, um, Karen. Okay. So I don't know um, what other link might um, not be working. 
Um, there's that one, like I said, the, um, this is last week's class. This is the class um, that is shooting infrared on. Jack here, let's see if we can do a few tips and tricks related to shooting. So this walks you through um, shooting in Lightroom and it's different modes of pro, HDR, um, auto, the different settings associated with it. And, uh, and even using the technology previews of um, exposure, depth map but, uh, and long exposure. Of, say, it, so uh, I believe all the, all the links are working. Um, if not, um, if somebody can just tell you, Karen, and you can pass along to me, but um, there you go. Okay. Well, the one thing that you have to remember is this one right here, because all of this, including all the graphic images, are at this one right here. Okay, tiny URL, Davis Chicago Files, 12221. And that's a zip file. And again, that will have um, all the other files, which includes um, things like. Um, a list of the apps and their icons, the Snapseed, the retouching, which talks about things like Focus and Touch Retouch. The, these are the basic ones that I like in the uh, native editor and talking about things like portraits, the invitation to Hawaii, and then that seven step tango for Lightroom. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. I, I, thank you, you all for having me. You've given us a lot to process uh, in our heads as well as our photos. So we thank you so much. It was delightful and uh, very educational. And we look forward to seeing you in May. May 22nd, that's also down here. Mark your calendar. And again, right now the topic is integrating Lightroom and Photoshop workflow. And by streamlining it, I mean using those things like the presets uh, targeted adjustments, speeding up your workflow, being able to use both Lightroom and Photoshop in concert. Um, we'll have a great, we'll have a great, great time. And Jack, is YouTube purposely separated by a period in those uh, links? That's what they gave me. So yes, but definitely it has to be exactly this one. That's why I gave you a PDF. So there, as you can see, these are live links. Okay. So if you click on it, you don't have to retype it in. Just click on it and it should automatically launch, you know, it should automatically launch. Exactly the same. Right. Thanks so much. It was great. Thank you. Yes. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you guys. Get some rest and uh, we'll see you all in May or in Hawaii. Um, do, if you're looking for another conference that's coming up, um, Photo Fusion. I didn't add a link to it. I should have. Um, uh, F-O-T-O-F-U-S-I-O-N, Photo Fusion. Um, in Florida, it'll be next month. I'm going to be doing two more classes, um, some more on infrared on the iPhone. Um, but it, it's an excellent, excellent course, fantastic, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning instructors. Um, Photo Fusion, um, it'll be next month in uh, Florida, which makes no sense. I mean, it doesn't matter because nobody, teachers will actually be in Florida, but we'll have a good time. Um, please do look into that. I will be teaching there as well. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>